so thank you all for joining us today. This is a Dolores Cannon Original Support Forum webinar, and today is the 10th of November, 2016. And I have with me a very special guest and friend, Lori Paulina, a wonderful practitioner and a truly great guy all around. He's got some great stories to share. So today, we are looking at discussing a couple of topics. Uh, by request, one was trance depth. Uh, there's, <clears throat> you know, a lot of discussion in our community about the somnambulistic state and the different brainwave states and hypnosis and visualization and where we are and where our brain state is during all of this. And we talk about that all the time. And what Dolores mostly talked about was the somnambulistic state and its um, importance in healing. And as I was thinking about how we were going to discuss that, I thought about Lori particularly because he has some really great stories, uh, personal stories, very personal stories where he can talk to you about uh, what depth of trance he was in and how all that happened for him in various forms and stories he has of his own personal healings. And that's why I've asked Lori to join me today. But he's not the only one, okay? Uh, we want to talk about that practitioners all across the board are getting healings uh, in sessions, sometimes during the interview portion <laughs> of the session, okay? Sitting in those chairs. Sometimes, I mean, one of my best stories ever is of a woman just laying there uh, who didn't participate in the session one way or another that most people would have thought that was a complete and utter failure. And it was one of the most extraordinary outcomes I have had to date in eight years. So, you know, we need to talk about uh, the somnambulistic state and uh, possibly why it's not completely required for healing. And um, because Lori has such great stories, uh, that's why I thought those two things might align nicely today. Um, your stories and for you in the community to get to know Lori a little bit, his stories, and also, you know, to pretty much talk around this topic about trance and trance depth. So I want to welcome everybody, but I want to especially welcome you, Lori. So I'm going to, I'm going to start out by uh, telling you all the first time I ever met Lori. And I, it's such a, a fond memory of mine. It was in uh, September of 2014, which was going to end up being the last classes that Dolores Cannon would ever teach. And I've, in, in real life, anyway, and I have such fond memories of this and um, very warm memories, and I know many of you out there have them as well. Uh, it was her largest class ever, and upon reflection and speaking with many of you after the fact, weeks, months, and even years after the fact, many of you knew what I also knew in my heart, which was that's the last, that was going to be her last class, um, and it was. So anyway, I showed up early to open up the auditorium doors for the class, uh, the level one class that day, and when I walked into the convention center, and it's like really early, you know, and I, I don't know, I'll probably have my coffee or something, and there's this fella standing right by the door, and that's Laurie, and his eyes were like this wide. And he was, and he had like a notebook or something on his chest, and he, you just, you couldn't contain the enthusiasm. Uh, it was so astonishing, just that meeting, the, the utter joy that was exuding from you and your body <laughs> and about being there. It, it just warmed my heart then, and even now remembering it. And you, I think, already started to tell me your story, even there at the front door, when, when I was unlocking the door to go in um, for the auditorium and the classroom. And so this is a really great place, um, I think, for you, maybe to tell the story, Lori. I know I sent the link or put up the link, and we'll put the, we'll put the link up on this as well to go to your website and people can read in um, text your story. But why don't you give us your story in your own words right now, Lori? All right. Um, I was at that front door much earlier, but uh, <laughs> nobody was there. So 
I didn't know that. I went for a cup of coffee and, and came back. Um, but I was so excited to be there. Uh, and I guess uh, I had been fresh, uh, fresh off the miracle belt <laughs> and uh, just was so enthused to uh, learn Dolores' technique. But um, I'll give you my story. Uh, I had a long history of, of soul searching and, and um, philosophic background and was always searching for things and always trying to, you know, awaken as best as I could. And I was living in Denver at the time. I had lived 20 years in Santa Fe as an artist and um, moved to Denver and stayed with some friends of mine who had a uh, big house and I was able to stay with them and, and work a little bit for them. And uh, so I was at their be behest, you know, I was trying to fit in there and be helpful and stuff like that. And I, and I worked for them and I uh, practiced music and walked and made dinners for them. So I was constantly active at their house. And um, I had to go back to Buffalo where I'm from um, because my mom had passed away and my brother who had been her caretaker was sort of just lost. You know, he thought that she was going to be senile for the rest of eternity. And a close friend of mine said, Oh, well uh, you should read Michael Newton's books, uh, journey of souls and destiny of souls. And so uh, I read them and it was amazing in that, I had believed in, in reincarnation, but my only venture to find out about it was the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And that was, you know, it said you died, you came back and forth, you had 40 days to come back. It just didn't um, resonate with me. It didn't make sense. And so I never took it any further, but I did believe there was a spirit realm and all that. So I... Um, You know, I, I wanted to find out about the spirit realm. I read those books and I was so turned on by it. I, I sent it to my cousin, Janet, who the next day sent me a link to Dolores's the, uh, more Kevin Moore show. And it was just an audio. I didn't even see her. And so I was listening to it and she just uh, blew the top of my head off. It was like everything she said was just spot on and resonated in my body. I mean, I think she you know, opened up every chakra and then some, you know, right away. And I said, I have to read these books, you know, because she talked about her books. So I went to the library and thanks to Dolores's method of interlibrary loan, which I suggest to everyone, um, I was able to get her all of her, uh, I think it was 17 books at the time, um, through the Denver Library, which had none, none of those books on their own. And I read all 17 of them in a matter of two months. So I was wow. just, everybody was making fun of me at the dinner table because I, <laughs> I said, you don't understand, this is too, too great. And uh, it was just tremendous. And then I said to myself, well, I really have to study with her. You know, I got this feeling like she wasn't going to I was just flabbergasted that reading those books that she was still alive, number one, and number two, that she was still teaching. It was like, oh, my God. But, you know, I was very practical, and I said, all right, well, I'll get a session in Denver with a practitioner and see if I like the modality and, you know, if it's something I think I can do. Because I had never done hypnosis. I, I do psychic work and, and spiritual counseling, but I was never really um, – into hypnotherapy. So I had a session, the woman was lovely, and um, very ma matter of fact, and uh, she just said, no matter what, say, okay, when I ask to speak to your higher self. And so I did. 111. Uh, I'm just saying it's 111 as I'm checking the time. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, Don't rush me, Candace. I got <laughs> Just joking. Uh, so it wound up being that uh, that when she asked 
I had a crooked back. Uh, my shoulders were uh, uneven due to a childhood uh, accident, and my sacrum was crooked, and my left foot was pronated and sort of just life, not lifeless, but I mean, I couldn't really walk on it. I just sort of used it almost like a peg leg. So the left leg was weird, uh, the foot, and um, and the uh, left shoulder was a good, you know, two and a half, three inches lower than my right shoulder. And I had co continuously been suffering for the past maybe year and a half with really bad stiffness in the back that I couldn't abide by. So I was going to a chiropractor, but he wasn't helping. Um, so she asked during, you know, and I had a past life or two, it was working, you know, I was a salamander and a, and a space alien. <laughs> but uh, then she said, could Lori heal his back? And at that point, I was about as lucid as I am now. And I just sort of chuckled because it's like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, I hope so. Is basically what I said. I was so light in trance, and um, and that was the end of the uh, the thing. You know, it was just sort of like lame. And I uh, I said goodbye to her, and she said, you know, just give it a week or or so. She says, and see what happens. So a week to the day was the Fourth of July. We lived in a fancy part of the neighborhood where the um, country club was. And on the 4th of July, they let off all these bombs, you know, explosions and stuff. I was home alone. I was practicing the cello and my back was killing me. And I said, oh, I'll take a hot bath and maybe I'll feel more. Uh, well, wouldn't you know, one of those explosions uh, came all the way to the house. I don't know how it happened, but... Uh, I guess my higher self must have coordinated it, but it exploded right next to the bathroom window and with like, you know, boom, you know, and it rattled the window and the energy of this explosion uh, went, you know, rifled right through me. And uh, the second that happened, I looked down and the first thing I saw was my chest and it was, in a gray wool suit with gold buttons and a whole bunch of medals to the left. And I gathered immediately that I was, uh, I was wearing a Confederate outfit. I just looked down further and I saw blood everywhere. And I looked down further and I didn't have any legs. And I saw at a distance my legs and it was so rivetingly real that I thought that I just said to myself, I'm dead. That's the end of my life. You know, it's over. Oh my God. You know, and then one second later, I realized I was in the bathtub. All of a sudden it was like then. <laughs> and I said, Oh my God, this is the time now, you know, it's the present is now and I'm in a bathtub and it's not that, you know, and the relief from this traumatic experience was like overwhelming. And in fathoming this relief, I saw what looked like, um, you know, like when you're looking at a, a grill and the heat waves come up. So I saw like an invisible heat wave or whatever of that trauma, apparently, like just lift out of me. You know, I just saw it rise to the ceiling. And then I felt elated, but I was more like freaked out than elated. <laughs> and I said, I am getting out of this bathtub <laughs> right now. <laughs> like, you know, voodoo bathtub or something. So I jumped out of the bathtub and I dried off and being crooked and like, you know, older, you know, I'm, I was obsessed with like, how bad I'm looking, you know? So I always looked in the mirror, you know, to see how, just how crooked I was and how old I was. And my shoulders were straight. And I said, what? You know, this can't be. So I, I spent the next week, I didn't tell anybody. I spent the next week looking in the mirror, looking in reflections in shop windows and tried to see if I was holding myself differently or whatever. And every time I looked perfectly straight. 
uh, I also had a shoe lift because I had a special shoe. It had a metal arch in it and a, and a shoe lift. And uh, I walked every morning for like three miles. So I didn't take the shoe lift off because I just didn't believe that anything was really, really happened. And lo and behold, my back started to hurt. So I took, I said, I'm going to just take it out and see if it, you know, works or whatever. And all of a sudden I was fine. My back didn't hurt at all. And um, I just couldn't believe it. So I called her up a week later and I said, I waited a week. I tested everything out and, you know, I feel completely, you know, normal. My back is, you know, and she said, oh, yeah, yeah, that happens. She was like, she could care less. <laughs> she, I, she could care less, but she, sure. she was just so. I heard know, that normal. before. Yeah, it was like just normal. So uh, I immediately uh, c like called up and, and booked the Dolores uh, class, and I went to Arkansas. And that's why I was so excited was because I had such a miraculous healing. Um, then we broke up at the end of the week into groups and uh, Cynthia Buckner was my partner and, uh, and one other person, uh, Holly, I forget her last name. And, um, and we all did healings on each other. And what I noticed about Cynthia when Holly did her was that at one point she looked like she was having a heart attack or something. I was like looking at her like, what's going on? And afterwards she said, I felt like I was being electrocuted. She said, I will never doubt the SC because, you know, it was so rivetingly painful, but like present. So I registered that in my head. Uh, and then uh, she did uh, Cynthia, it was my turn and Cynthia did me. And she said, uh, the second time the, the SC really came through. I was having a life uh, as a eagle, and it was incredible. I mean, it was like a a scope with lines. You know, uh, the vision was like uh, like a te like a telescope on a on a naval ship or something. So if you look down, you can see the longitude and latitude lines. So if anything moved, you could zero in on on it and pick it up. So being an eagle was fantastic, and uh, Towards the end, uh, I felt like mud was being splashed in my eyes. And I said, well, what's this all about? And I looked down and there I had a talon. <laughs> and in the talon was a snake. And the snake must have been picked up from a river bed or something. And it was splashing wet mud in my eagle eye. <laughs> and because I had tarried to just, you know, figure out what that was, I heard in the distance like some voices and I noticed they were saying, well, he doesn't, uh, we're mean to him because he doesn't listen to us. And I realized that that was my own voice, that Cynthia had already begun the SC part and that because I had dallied to figure out what the mud was, that I just sort of like bifurcated or something. And so that's what happened. Uh, so she said, well, and she was such a great practitioner. And she said, if Lori promises to do what you say, you know, uh, listen to you, will, will you heal his left foot? And the reason my foot was so lame was because of the calf muscles. They were like atrophied from not use or the crooked spine or whatever. Um, so I came back uh, to Denver and on the plane, I noticed something. I made a mental note of something that was going on in a cloud. It just was phenomenal or whatever. So when I finally listened to my tape, it said, look, uh, it, it mentioned that cloud moment. The tape did. It was like they were trying to tell me like, you know, we're telling you the future or whatever. And then I said, what did I promise? You know, here I promised something. So I listened to the tape and it said, you must rest. Well, it turned out that I have been an artist all my life and 
never had funding from my family. So I was struggling to survive my whole life. And I did a great job up to like 57 years old or whatever, but it was getting hairy and uh, I was living with these people trying to save money. So I was just constantly, constantly efforting and trying to survive, trying to make money, trying to, you know, get my career in art and music going all the time in different cities. And I was like bedraggled from all this, you know, aggressive, you know, survival. And it was kind of like that eagle. Uh, that was a similar message in that eagle past life. Anyhow, uh, I said, all right. Uh, they, they said, I have to rest. So I'm not going to get up at six in the morning and go walking. I'm not going to practice the cello before work. I'm not going to uh, uh, come home from work and, you know, make dinner for everybody. I'm not going to make my macrobiotic lunches uh, early in the morning. I'm just going to lay in bed and go to work and then come back and rest. So I did that for a month. And while I laid there, I had some realizations. And one of them was that I was telling everyone I was exploded by a bomb. And, uh, and then I said, well, this was a civil war. There were no bombs. So it was a cannon. And then I said, oh, my God, Dolores Cannon. And then I said, well, what does Dolores mean? I had a cousin named Dolores, and we always knew that meant pain in Spanish. Dolores means pain. So a painful cannonball stop me from killing in the civil war and then dolores cannon uh in this life gave me new marching orders to be you know doing healings and waking people up so i realized i had two run-ins with dolores cannon <laughs> in my life and so uh that was the beginning of it then i realized you know sort of the grievous uh, egregious er errors of war and all that stuff. And uh, I started to really decide to, you know, make some shifts and really stop struggling and maybe let the universe start to do its half rather than me doing three quarters and it doing, you know, here and there. And so it said, if I did what it said, it would heal the leg in two months. Well, in a month and a half, I uh, was sleeping in the middle of the night, and at midnight, I it was the October 26th or whatever, uh, I felt like I was having, I was being electrocuted. When I was a kid, I went to a fun house, and they had a, a chair there that had a little vault going through it, so I knew what that felt like, you know, uh, it's supposed to be funny, but it wasn't. Uh, and so I didn't know what to do, and I, I realized if I deeply breathe, it will um, abate, you know, because, you know, deeply breathing is so great. So I did that, and 20 minutes later, it stopped. And I said, that must have been what happened to Cynthia, because it, it felt like how she looked. Mm -hmm. But thought no more of it, and I got up to go to work. I took a shower. I went to put my shoes on. And my foot would not fit into that metal shoe. You know, it was all built for a lame foot and, you know, it just wouldn't fit. So I had some sneakers that didn't have that set up in it. And, um, and I, I just realized I was standing on the edge of my foot correctly. It, it was like all of a sudden, usually I could pretend like I was standing correctly, but I couldn't hold it for more than a second. But now I was, without even thinking about it, I was completely standing on it correctly. And the muscle was in the calf was holding it up, no problem. And to this day, which is years later, I've not stood the other way. I've st stood correctly. It did take two months of walking around the park very slowly and seeing how my right foot touched the ground when I walked and then imitate it with my left because I was just like, you know, walk slam my foot down, walk, slam my foot down. Now both feet started to walk correctly. So, so you were, you were learning, relearning how to walk because uh, well. I think you were telling me when you were first telling me this story, you said you used to kind of just throw that foot. Yeah. And then just plop it down. Like, you know, just like a piece of, uh, you know, steak or something, you know, uh, 
it was almost like a peg leg, although it, I had a foot on it. <laughs> and, and it was uh, many, many years, right? I, I, my memory is you were like nine. I was, nine. I was like 13 till 13. 57 or something, yeah. Yeah, so, crazy. Um, and to this day, I continually walk, and the arch, which wasn't there before, slowly over the years has carved out just like water rubbing against its stone or something. So now I have an arch in both feet. Uh, and so and that gonna, is amazing. I'm going to stop you because I want to, I want to ask some questions and, and, okay. and I know you've got more stories, well, but for, uh, for people who are listening, uh, I've been taking a few notes. So, um, I want to I want to mention some things and then I want to ask you some questions if that's okay. So the first thing is, and I'm learning. You know, you and I have talked um, many times since meeting in 2014. But I've uh, because of the l wonderful way you've told your story today, I've learned more about uh, some of the timing and some of the things that were going on here. So when you had your very first initial session in Denver, you said you were a salamander and a space alien. But you did not experience a civil war life. Is that true? Not at all. Isn't that interesting? So for the practitioners out there, think about this, right? You know, he, he, he didn't even go to the place that seems to be the, the impetus of what happened to your sacrum, right? You, you had a salamander and a space alien life. Um, may I ask, what did you learn about those two experiences? Why did your higher self say that? Well, I'm, I'm, I, I was uh, surprised when you just started to ask how it all of a sudden it clicked in my head. This salamander, I was like looking at, I was at something like a salamander in the Vietnam War, <laughs> you know? Wow. And, and it was like I was climbing up tanks and stuff like these like green light green tanks with like big you know nozzles on them or whatever a tank has to shoot the stuff and i'm like you know like what are these people doing what are the what where you know it was like you're in my jungle and all of a sudden we well, are killing each other what how ridiculous is this so i climbed up to a tree and looked down at it and was just like baffled so so that's what clicked in my head is like it was sort of like this this is when i started to realize how war is maybe ridiculous where in the civil war i might have bought into the idea of war. Exactly. <laughs> um yeah. and then the space alien thing was uh when we went to take the class it was in the hilton that i stayed and we also had the class next to it or whatever and it had this enormous lobby it was like eight stories high, you know, and all the rooms were around the periphery of this huge lobby. Well, this life as an alien, I uh, was on a ship, and then the next thing I know, I was in a plat, like a, you know, like this front cement entrance to what looked like a glass dome, and I walked in it, and it looked just like that lobby except it was all glass and i stood there and i looked up at like maybe the eighth floor or whatever and there was a panel of counsel and they said they were ch chewing me out not really but they were letting me know in no uncertain terms that i had failed in whatever it was my mission was and i just felt like <laughs> you know like, boy, I'm getting chewed out, you know, not really, but, mm -hmm. but it was a disappointment because I had failed okay. and I don't know what the subject matter was. Okay. Um, I want to mention a couple other things. When you talked about the explosion going off by, okay, no, wait, I'm going to back up and ask or mention this. I have a memory of you telling me about this story before and correct me if I'm wrong. You said, before going in to take your bath, you had listened to the session for the first time. Is that true? Or am I misremembering? You are right. I, I had, uh, I just said, uh, you know, they said to listen to it a number of times. So I said, oh, you know, uh, I will, uh, I'll, and, and this was before I practiced. This was right. 
a few minutes before I practiced, uh -huh. I just listened to the healing part. I wasn't going to listen okay. to anything else. I just listened to the healing part, which was very short. I mean, it didn't. And it was long. you. And it was you saying. And yeah. Yeah. I, I'm it's, right here. It's just me. This sounds like I'm just talking like we're sitting on the sofa, right? Right. So I, I when she said Ken Laurie, she said it in such a mysterious way. Can <laughs> Laurie heal his back? Or could you heal Laurie's back? And it was like, you asking me this right this right. minute. So I just said, well, I don't know. I hope so. Right. You know? And it just, just sounded like you and your the own conscious voice. mind just said, I All hope that. so. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, wanted, I wanted to make sure. Okay. So, so that's number one. Um, I want, I wrote it down when you said this, when you said that the explosion happened by the window and then that energy, you know what word you used? The energy rifled through you. Ah, it did. So that well, I picked, I picked that uh, on that right away. Well, it's interesting that you're saying that because the final story that you're going to ask me yes. had to do with a rifle wound. Yes, so. and we're going to talk about that too. Uh, but before we even move on to that, I also want to say, and as I'm saying this now, my body is buzzing wildly. You had this entire experience immersed in water. Water, yes. which we are talking about with the idea of, you know, uh, the beyond quantum healing or some of the information that is coming through from Dolores and or Emoto from various sources talking about the importance of using water in a session, drinking it, putting intentions in it. Uh, even at, at the webinar we had in Missouri talking about the idea of putting somebody's feet in it during a session, which all sounds a little hokey hooey and whatever. And even I didn't think to your specific session is until you started talking about how your entire experience here happened with you kind of immersed in water. And I mean, I'm kind of imagining you kind of laying back and being really That's exactly what happened. But I do have to say, uh, you know, on top of that, that bomb exploding next to the window was really yeah. the orchestration of my uh, higher self. You know, that was orchestrated. Uh, but yes, the the medium that I was in was water, and yeah. I, it did have a, a very um, vivid uh, recreation going there. Mm -hmm. That's really amazing. Okay. Um, so go ahead and, uh, you know, one of the reasons I was trying to change, send something on the chat here. It said, I can't do that because not everyone's there. I don't know why it's, I was just going to say um, to Crystal, yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Crystal, before we even got to that, was talking about that, you know, that you were in water when all of this happened. And it's, it's what I wrote down and, and mentioned just now out loud. Um, you had some really interesting things happen subsequently about the, the Confederate soldier and then something uh -huh. else and another healing that happened to you. And this, this, uh, this particular healing, and I want everyone to realize this too, it didn't even have anything to do with the session. It, I think, you know, all of this study and all of these ideas and all of these other sessions and, and the, this work that we do brought you to a place where you had a healing that you literally watched happen just, I don't even know where you were, sitting on your own sofa or whatever. So go ahead and tell us that story. Okay, so, um, and and then maybe talk later about the, the development of the Civil War thing. Do either, whatever makes most sense for you, because I don't have all the facts straight, but you know, okay. both of these uh, stories are amazing. Well, they're all related, so I'll tell you the third story, um, which is, so I get back to Denver. I have the two miracles behind or under my belt. And then I still uh, had some issues which developed. And so I said to myself, I had a cough that was just not stopping. It was like, I've had coughs all my life. This did not stop. And also the weirdest thing happened you know, living in Denver, I don't know what kind of spiders they have there. And one morning I woke up and it was like, I looked at my leg and it looked like 
I had gotten bit by some like nasty spider. And I, I monitored it for like a day or two. And instead of it like rising and becoming swollen or whatever, it sunk. Like, you know, when rain hits on a grave and makes it sink a little bit. And I said, well, what is, is this a brown res recluse or something? Is it eating my leg from within? You know, so I took my pants off at the dinner table and showed everybody <laughs> just a little bit, you know. Uh, and <laughs> sorry, Ken, this is going I'm just on, imagining really going on record. Uh, and <clears throat> everybody said, oh, yeah, it is sunken, you know. And it, all I could think of was it looked like a bullet hole. It was that size. Well, as the days, weeks, and month proceeded, it changed. And it, it looked like the size of a chiclet, you know, chiclet gum. But not the little ones. They made those jumbo ones, which was about, you know, that size. And it was on my leg, my right leg, and it started to grow. And it was like blue and purple and it didn't hurt and it didn't itch, but it was sort of like somewhere in between there. And I, it started to get thick. So it was about an inch and a half or more, like subcutaneously and above the skin. And I didn't have health insurance, you know, part of my struggling life. And uh, so I just said, Ugh, what is this gonna turn into? And so, I finally said, you know, I'm doing all these healings, you know, all these sessions because, you know, I wanted to go to level two right away. So I had like 10 sessions, 15 sessions under my belt at that point. And I said, I'm talking to everybody else's SC. Why can't I talk to my own? So I said, well, maybe if you just, you know, because it was sort of there, even though I wasn't deeply entranced. So maybe I can just talk to it, you know. So I lay down and asked it for, you know, I don't know if I asked it for healing. I just sort of started to build a relationship with it. That's what I was doing and said, I loved it and show me more of who you are and all that stuff. And then at one point I said, all right, I'm just going to use my own voice. So I said, higher self, uh, could I please speak with you? And then with my own voice, I said, yes. <laughs> and, um, and then I said, uh, could you heal my cough? And at, at, at that time, I was working with a whole bunch of people. And there was some people at the top that were very, very abusive. And I got an intuitive hit, like as loud as can be, that said, no, you are getting abused at work. And every time you cough, that's you saying no to the abuse. And I said, all right, that sounds, you know, I'll buy that and I'll take note and I'll think of that. And then without dropping a beat, I just said, could you, well, how about my chiclet on my leg? No sooner did I say those words and all of a sudden it felt like because I watched the movie Austin Powers, <laughs> where there's a laser beam. I felt like a laser beam stitching, you know, like horizontally the length of this thing and then vertically the width of it. Like someone had stitched over it, patched over it with a sewing machine. And I almost think I heard crackling, you know, like how a laser beam would crackle as it's burning into metal or something. And after that finished, I was like so, you know, flabbergasted. I like second time in the same month, I pulled my pants down and I looked and it was gone. The patch that remained was what looked like burnt skin. It was sort of like, I don't know, skin colored, but like burnt. Like my cousin is a, a nurse and I went to her immediately and she said, Laurie, that looks like it was burned. The skin looks burned. And so I was just, and then a week later, there was a penumbra around the, the area that was red and it was 
it was like it was uh, expunging what had vaporized below the skin. And so someone gave me some clay and I put it on there and it sucked it out, you know, and so then it was gone. And over a year passed and I moved to Buffalo and, you know, there was a couple little red spots on this patch. It was sort of beige and red. And almost like if you were sifting something or if you had sand and you turn the vibration and it made a pattern, uh, it seemed like as it was healing slowly, the skin finally turned back to normal. Uh, what remained was a dusting of red. And when I looked, it, I kept on, it, it started to look like numbers, but I said, oh, what is this, 53 or whatever. Finally, it, it, it reached its, its final position and it said 33. And I have a picture of it that is just incontrovertible. Do you have that? I do. Go get that. Well, I mean, it's on my phone, though. I don't know if this is good. Okay. Phone. So uh, now this is the second part of this story, and that is that, um, excuse me. Second part of the story is that prior to any Dolores Cannon activity, I um, he took a painting class, right? I took a painting class. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm looking for this picture. That's all right. I was gonna uh, I was gonna help you out here a little bit while you're while you're searching. So Laurie mm -hmm. took this painting class and the uh, and the uh, assignment was to paint a portrait. And I think that Laurie just painted a portrait out of his own imagination. And right. he yeah, they, said, they said to just, uh, you know, paint uh, anything and just use your imagination. So I did. And uh, because I was going to paint a picture of the people that I lived with and I wanted to do a nice job. So I took a painting class and did that. And after I did that, it, it turned out that, uh, that the person, it sort of painted itself. It was kind of weird. And then it looked like the person was a civil war person. And I said, well, uh, what's this about? You know? And so I made gold buttons on, on him, you know, and then I made epaulets like right here, just cause I know that, you know, I like Van Gogh and he painted a portrait of a postman. And so I sort of imitated that. And I tried to get those epaulets to look realistic and they didn't. So I said to myself, um, all right, well, I will just fashion this one to look like a three, which I did. And then I did the other one with the three. So Yeah, like mirror uh, image. Yeah, and then it didn't look right, so I switched the other three to a, 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 a real three. And so, and I thought nothing of it other than, you know, that looks better. And I left it like that. And then I put it away, moved to Buffalo. And when I was decorating my apartment, I put this portrait up and, uh, and it was a, it wasn't a Confederate. It was a blue, you know, like a, a Northern, what was it called? A Yankee. And so, um, so uh, I had it up in the, the, on the ceiling there and I had a client come and she was super intuitive and uh and she looked at that and she said that person killed you in a past life and i said oh i thought it was myself who had died in a past life and um candace i don't know where this is all right let's, so, let's Put this yeah. up later as a link okay. to uh, oh, yeah. the show, so don't worry oh, about it, okay? okay. So yeah, yeah, now yeah. you can totally. just finish telling your story. I know, it's distracting. It's I, okay. I showed it to someone just the other day, so I thought it was right there. Um, so she said, no, that, that person, uh, that's a Confederate, and he was from, or that was, he was a Yankee, and he was from the 33rd Regiment. And I said, oh, that's what the 33 is. So I thought, oh, I will go 
Now, let me just back up one second. This was when they said the three waves of ascension and uh, September 28th of 2015 was the first wave. All that month, I was feeling like my insides were being burned alive. Like I was just all the negativity was being burned up. I felt like I was being cleansed and purified. And, and they said the 28th was going to be the first ascension. And I said, I, I'm going through it right now. I mean, it really feels like it. Well, this was on the 28th. And when this client left, she said, that's the man that killed you. And uh, he was from the 33rd Regiment. Well, I'm sorry to back up one more time, but I am an Emily Dickinson fanatic, and I've studied her all my life. And the sad part about El Emily Dickinson, seemingly, was that she was so afraid to be public that um, at one point, a man who owned a publishing company said, anybody, he put this out in the newspaper, anybody that thinks they're talented enough to write, send me your poems and I will publish them if you're good enough. And she sent him epic poems that were mind blowing. And he wrote back and said, sorry, you're not talented enough. And she continued to send him better and better poems if they could even get better. And he rejected all of them. When she died, she hadn't published at all. And so her sister got him to publish her work, but he obliterated it. He said, I'll publish it, but I have to fix it because it's so bad. So he changed it all. So for the next 70 years, the American public only read his version of her poems. So he, I wanted to strangle him. And his name was Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Well, a couple of years ago, I lived with an artist. He was having a show. He invited me to Dartmouth College to hang the show. He said, I got you a bed and breakfast. You will stay there. I did. I came down to breakfast. The people that owned the bread and breakfast were there. And I looked at their wall of, you know, things like all these pictures behind me. And I looked at one of the pictures. I said, I know him. And the lady said, oh, you can't. She said, that's my great grandfather. And I said, it's Thomas Wentworth Higginson. She said, you're right. And I said, well, I'm an Emily Dickinson, a holic, <laughs> and, and you know. And she said, oh, he was so wonderful and he helped her so much. You know, uh -oh. I was like, I, I had to hold myself back from strangling her. <laughs> and uh, so, so just that's the background of Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Anyway, so. Uh, I, the lady left, she said the 33rd regiment and she said, uh, she said, and I said, I have a 33 on my leg. And she says, well, yes, they, they would brand the people they killed with their stamp. You know, like we killed the 33rd regiment killed this Confederate soldier. So, and I showed her and she said, yep, that's what it looks like. So she left, and I went immediately to the internet to see about the 33rd Regiment, and could I find a picture of that guy? Well, I found a picture of that guy, and he was the head commander of the whatever, and the 33rd Regiment, uh, the, the supreme leader of that, it said Thomas Wentworth Higginson. And I said, what? And I looked, and, it, and then it had a link to Emily Dickinson, and that when he finally got out from the North, being the commander of the 33rd, uh, you know, he set up this newspaper and had a con con conversation with her and, you know, all that stuff. So it was that day, the 28th of Ascension, it was like all of a sudden the veils were opening up, and I was seeing that maybe, I don't know why I'm so, you know, Emily Dickinson is just like so part of me. So it's like, you know, could I have been like part of her and this guy at the same time? Because it happened at the same, yeah, the 1860s. So, um, you know, could that be, and that that was my nemesis in that life, you know, and you know what I'm saying? So, I do. Uh, just so. such amazing, amazing connections and so, so many fabulous stories. You know, since we were starting to talk about trance depth and, um, and proving healings, I wonder if you couldn't just 
talk about your own realizations right now. What trance depth and what mind state is sure. is that you've come to the conclusion is necessary to achieve some of the really miraculous healings that you've had, and also a little bit possibly about and we we, did, we ran out of time beforehand i was going to talk to you about some of because i believe you've had like scans and then rescans. Um, mm -hmm. we've had some of those questions so if you would talk about um you know mind states trance depth healing what you think are the real components the necessary components for healing and then some of maybe you know what you have for testing and maybe a way that we can present that or maybe places that you've already presented it to the public yeah. Um, well, as far as all that proof stuff, I um, had a uh, I always get that wrong. Zero, not Xerox X-ray um, of my back prior to it and afterwards. And uh, my chiropractor went over it with me, and he did show me where the sacrum did not like shift, but the rest of the back straightened itself out, and he did. You know, he measured it and he wrote the, the differences in measurement between the two. And I have those. Um, and uh, my foot, uh, I mean, I, I didn't take a picture of my foot before, but, uh, but everybody that knows me, my family, I could get people to testify because, I mean, they've lived with me all my life and know, known the whole thing. Um, uh, what other proof? Uh, the the thing on my leg, I have people that were with me. My cousin Susan saw it. I took pictures of it uh, before and after. So, you know. Do you still have those pictures? And and can you see the 33 on them? It's. I think you might have yeah. sent one of those to me. I think you could. Yeah, I did send you the 33 one. Um, mm -hmm. And I do have the picture. I know I emailed it off, off of my phone to to me, so I just have to go dig it out of my emails yeah um, if i would have i i uh, went swimming with my iphone and it took the uh, pictures away but uh maybe they're on the cloud i don't know but uh but i do have them in email i'd have to search them out um but depth of trance uh you know what i learned from dolores when in that last class um that she taught I, you know, I, I, I sort of read all those books and it was all, you know, synambulistic, uh, right. sort of channeled type of books. Mm -hmm. And um, so I said, you know, I had a, this miraculous healing and it was lighter, but it, you know, and she, I said, you know, I was not in that deep state. And she said, yeah, we're seeing that now. Uh, a lot more that people's vibrations have raised and they don't really need to go that deep. But I mean, I, I really had this, like, um, I really had this question for her because it was like, you're saying everybody goes into this deep thing and I'm living proof that you don't, or you don't have to. Right. Um, then what I found more helpful than any physical healing and this is interesting my brother asked me he said does it feel like a miracle all this stuff and i said i thought and i said no it feels more like that was a bad dream and i woke up from it so that's interesting uh but more important than any physical healing was the realization that we are embers of god our soul is an actual piece of God and it resides in house. And our journey in ascension or enlightenment or uh, awakening is to forge a relationship with this element, which is sort of the parent and the partner you never had. You know, the only one that can really give you love, the only one that can really guide you. And, uh, and so to build a relationship and that it is possible to build a relationship by just speaking to it. And so I went on a journey from that day uh, to build a relationship with my higher self. And, 
and in retrospect, I think what caused uh, my healing, and I have a sneaking suspicion would help other people to heal, is that I was willing to change. I was willing to stop efforting to s let my heart melt by sort of like uh, loving myself and calming down and trusting my higher self and learning to work with it like a co-pilot would work with a pilot. And, uh, and by calming my sort of inflamed ego or my emotional mind, by uh, calming it down uh, and working more with the help and the guidance and the comfort of the higher self, I was able to start making choices from my heart rather than constantly from the brain trying to get ahead. And I'll give you a quick example, you know, like rather than saying, oh, that person's brother-in-law works at the company I want to get a job at, I'm going to have them over for dinner and pick his brain. Instead, you don't even think like that. You just notice that she's depressed and you invite her over for dinner. And, and then she, she mentions, oh, my brother-in-law works here. You should get together with him. So it's sort of like your heart makes the choice and then everything works out rather than you half a brain co-pilot, you know, trying to enact the journey of your life rather than working hand in hand with the one that wrote the, the sequence of events in your life, you know. Can, can we go back? Can I ask you about your cough? Um, you had a cough and it was because of, of abuse. Yeah. And, and what may I ask happened with that? Scenario? Uh, a week later, uh, I went down to Mexico because the people I stayed with wanted, they had a house in Mexico and they've been wanting me to go forever. So we went down and I got there and there was a bowl of limes a gigantic bowl of limes and maybe 45 limes. And my friend said, I don't know what we're going to do with all these. And that night I couldn't stop coughing. And I went to the lime bowl. <laughs> I cut one in half and squeezed the whole thing into a, a teacup. And uh, I poured, uh, they had honey. I poured some honey in there and then, there was some tequila because they had tons of tequila and I put tequila okay. in there and I drank it and I slept through the night the first time in like three weeks. And all I did was drink nonstop. I drank all of those 45 limes and it went away. You know what? <laughs> Lori and probably a half a bottle of tequila. <laughs> Lori, you know what? I have to tell you something. I could pick up this computer right now and go show you, but I've got this bowl of limes in my kitchen right now. And one of the last things when I was getting oh my, my drink, do you see this? And it's got a little yeah. bit of juice in it. Yeah. yeah. Cause I said, what am I going to do with this bowl of limes? I can't believe you're coming. <laughs> That's funny. Oh There's so many connections, so many connections between people, between events, between, between things. Um, you know, it's just astonishing. If it, the one thing that I want people who are um, attending this webinar to know, especially those of you who, you know, were only around Dolores for your initial class or your only class, or maybe only online, that sentence that Lori <laughs> Um, said just a few minutes ago about uh, that Dolores that Dolores said uh, we're finding these things are changing is so true these were conversations that I had with Dolores in classes at the end of her life um, you know that year uh, 2014 we would talk about it and these amazing things that would happen in sessions uh, like I said during the interview portion or, and I know that you all, or I believe that you all have heard these stories before too, within classrooms and also within some of Dolores Cannon's lectures, just being in the audience and listening to some of these stories, people were able to access whatever it was, make whatever changes 
uh, they needed to to have healing without going to the somnambulistic state. When we first put the um, support forum together way back in, in 2008, for a good many months, uh, those of us, those first few people who came together and were asking each other questions because we were all new, uh, we would ask ourselves, what are we doing wrong? Because we found that not everyone went to the somnambulistic state and we didn't find that everyone was healing. And we would ask ourselves, what are we doing wrong? And of course, it took a great deal <laughs> of um, question, questioning and access to Dolores and time to pass to realize and understand a few things. Number one, we weren't doing anything wrong and neither are you out there, not at all. And Dolores herself, again, towards the end of her life, uh, would come to us and talk about how the somnambulistic state didn't seem to be necessary anymore for healing. But this is not how she taught, and it's not how she taught even to the end and even in um, her final classes. She was not going to teach that. And it's because of Dolores Cannon and her style just because something new would come down or some new realization would happen or she would notice something changing or expanding or morphing or whatever, she didn't just start talking about it. She didn't just start teaching it. She didn't just start doing it. She wanted many examples of whatever it was to come down the road and be presented to her uh, before she would use it and particularly before she would talk to her students about it. So yeah. even there at the end, when she was noticing it, she still wasn't talking about it. And when she was doing her teaching, she was in that zone where she was teaching the way she was teaching. And she was, you know, in her mid 80s. And everybody who knows people in that time frame, they can. And I, I will say that I believe Dolores is one of those people who just she's very comfortable. You know, she's very comfortable in, in doing things this way. And she was going to keep doing them. And it's not, if she was going to live another 15 years or 20 years, I fully expect and suspect that she would have changed some of these things in that way. But not until they were more solid, not until she saw them more. So she was seeing a lot of the things that we were seeing. She just wasn't ready to add that information into her classrooms to talk about it. Um, at the end. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, I, we, we mentioned that. So even though she saw it, uh, she wasn't really talking about it. Yeah, I, I you know, Dolores was a consummate um, researcher and corroborator. You know, she was very much scientifically um, focused and she was very responsible in her um, findings and her research and her methods. So, um, but when she, I know when she answered that question to me, um, for me, um, about, oh yeah, we're seeing a lot more that the vibration is raising and people don't need to go there. She, I, I was really, I was expecting not to be satisfied with her answer. And when she said that, it went into a, a different level um, in me, you know? Just like when on the 28th, I had that realization and all the veils of the different lives and the connections between the players in those different lives was revealed. It's like, I get it. You know, the higher your vibration, the more everything opens up, the connections can be seen behind the veil. And it's all an orchestrated assembly of guides, spirits, uh, players, uh, you know, realizations, thoughts promptings it's all like a soup you know that that without this am, uh, amnia, amnesia how do you say amniotic fluid or whatever you know that we can't see all all the connections you know once it's lifted you know it all fits together like a glove mm -hmm. and uh, she you know she she was very responsible in what she was doing yeah she was she was very careful and I love that about her. She, uh, you know, she didn't just, she, she was like a sailboat who would, you know, set course. And, um, and she was, you know, she would have a direction just because some stray wind came through. She wasn't going to change course just because of that. So even though she was noticing some of this towards the end, uh, you know, again, that didn't make it into her classroom. So 
Um, I don't see any questions um, or anybody asking anything in the chat room about it, um, any of this uh, that we're talking about. But um, and we've been on, um, we've been just past right. an hour. But I'm I'm happy to uh, hear any more thoughts. You know, one of the things that, um, if you don't mind, I I I'd kind of like to talk about. Uh, I don't know if this kind of aligns with our topic or not, but. Uh, a session that you, Laurie, did for me in uh, March of 2015. I think you probably remember that session. Uh, uh -huh. We were there and you were taking uh, the level uh, two class and I was uh, also there assisting in, um, in, in all the classes at the time. Uh, this is just a really interesting uh, session that I've never felt that I've gotten completely somnambulistic either. Uh, I have a very strong um, analyzer, left brain, logic side of my brain. Uh, and what I found really um, so unique and interesting about the session we did, so Lori uh, facilitated a session on me. And in a way, my brain was in three areas. <laughs> so I was, uh, wait, oh, wait, what are we looking at? Oh, oh, back it off. You're too close. Back it, back it off a little. Yeah, stop. Now hold it real still. Can y'all see that 33? That's amazing. Now, now go find, now go find that uh, painting. It'll be even cooler. There's uh, my underwear. <laughs> yeah, don't and, show that. <laughs> and then, uh, Here's the painting. Oh, good. Oh, good. He's going to show us the painting. So I'll pause my story while we go look at the painting. Oh. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Oh, oh there it's it up. Is. It's up. Oh. Oh. Could you see the yes. apples? Yes. Uh, now hold still. Isn't that amazing, everyone? Oh, gosh. Thank you so much. Thank you for showing. I'm trying to show you the yeah. guy. Yeah, there he is. And he looks at you all the time. <laughs> all right, I know so I'm, he gonna, does. I'm gonna finish my story real quick. But anyway, my brain was in three parts. So there was my conscious mind that was aware of absolutely everything. There was um, um, my higher self that was talking. And then there was I don't even know if I've ever said this to you, Lori. I felt it was kind of like my teaching mind, you know, my assistant teaching mind. There was a part of me, I would speak as my conscious mind, my higher self, and even then like uh, my, uh, my teaching, you know, because I just finished walking from upstairs and, you know, helping, assisting in, in teaching in the level two and three classes. And um, so during the session, laying down and having the session, I could, I could speak from any one of these perspectives and actually kind of did too, you know, like, okay, here's the teaching part of me saying something and here's the conscious mind part of me saying something. Here's my higher self. And whenever I speak with my, uh, and use my voice to speak for my higher self, it's exactly the same way you talked about it earlier on in, in the webinar when we were talking about it, that you just use your own voice and you kind of, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of giggling inside when I'm doing it. Oh, oh, oh. you know, a little, it's a little almost like joking, right? But that's why uh, we did it too. I actually was in a lot of pain. It was one of the reasons we had the session. I was uh, actually in the emergency room. I had been in the emergency room in Arkansas. Uh, happily, my husband was there taking excellent care of me. Um, I had a kidney stone, and it, uh, you know, it showed up on the scan, and I was needing to pass this kidney stone, and I knew that was going to hurt, and I didn't want to. So the idea was to have a session to have the kidney stone uh, be dissolved, so I didn't have to pass it because that hurts to pass kidney stones. Okay, and, you're yeah. back. You're back. Yeah. You you cut out. Oh, okay. So I I wanted a session to uh, pass this kidney stone, and my higher self said, "Okay, um, this is how." And I think about this all the time, especially when I'm walking, because I walk on these paths, these beautiful paths that uh, my husband created for us here on our farm. And my higher self told me in our session that 
I could dissolve the kidney stone, but I had to do something very specific. I had to wear my earthing shoes, my earthing boots. They have little copper um, uh, studs through the bottom, so you have direct electrical connection with the earth, right? Um, I would have to walk three miles a day um, for a week or something like that, and then that would dissolve my kidney stone. And internally, I'm, I'm having an absolute hysterical fit about how in the world uh, walking with metal on my feet on the planet is going to do anything at all for a stone inside of my kidney. You know, I, my logical part of my brain is having a field day throwing darts at how ridiculous this is, you know. And, but I did it anyway. And that whole week, it actually, you know, it was, it was, I did it for a week and we got all the way back and, and I was, like day six or whatever, and I was still in pain, and I went back to my doctor and got, uh, he said, well, I want you to have another scan. And he sent me to go, get an, uh, to go get another scan, and it's Friday, right? And I go get this scan on Friday, and I show up at, oh, I don't know, 1 p.m. or something like that, and I show up at the place where they do the scans, and I'm in pain. And... I hand over the paperwork for the to get the scan uh, done and the paperwork doesn't go through and they're like well they, they put the wrong code on this you know we need to put we need to get another code this is the wrong code you can't have the scan and there was like this paperwork snafu so I sat in the waiting room and at first I'm annoyed but not for very long because as we all know you need to go why is this happening right why is this happening? And I literally was there for two and a half hours um, waiting for, and they kept apologizing, and there was all these things in this, you know, the fax machine didn't have paper. Or, I mean, it just, you know, it went on and on, and I just sat there laughing because I knew something was up that was going to be helpful for me, even though I was in pain. And it, it, I ended up getting the scan really late. So what happens then? It's late Friday. I get a medical scan late on a Friday. It's not going to get rid, right? Everybody, all the doctors, all the, you know, all the radiologists, they're out playing golf or whatever. That, you know, I'm going to get my result on Monday. So the whole time I'm thinking that's because I just need, a, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm asking my higher self. Well, that's because you need a couple more days. You need the weekend to go and, and walk a couple more days with, you know, with your earthing boots on the, on the farm. And I'm still ouchy. I've done kidney stones before, and I was not a happy person. And I wake up Monday morning, and my pain is gone. It is completely gone. And first thing that happens after I make my coffee, the doctor calls with the results and says, Honey, I don't know, you know, why you were continuing to have pain, but you are completely clear. There is no kidney stone there at all. Now, see, what would have happened if I'd have gotten my scan early and gotten possibly my results early before having another couple days to walk, you know, my higher self or they or God or the universe set it all up so that I wasn't going to get any result till Monday so that I could get the result <laughs> that I needed. And, right. and it was just astonishing and amazing. And so when I think of you, Laura, I think about my, you know, how I didn't have to pass that kidney stone. And, um, and, and how absolutely kind of convoluted and crazy that was. Go, you know, go walk with these special shoes this long, this long on the ground, and then your kidney stone will go away. It's like, what? You know, I, you never told me that story until now. I didn't so. know if I did or not. So you I didn't. thought I would. So, so good. Uh, would you write a, a recommendation for me? <laughs> yes. Well, you're breaking up a little bit now, too. My internet connection may be going a little wonky. Um, I well, said, would you, would you write a testimonial for me? <laughs> I will, actually. I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it, you know, it's fascinating for me, too, because there is a part that, you know, we as healers, um, you know, it, it wasn't lost on me at all that I was spending my day uh, in the classroom with Dolores Cannon students teaching about self-healing and I end up in a medical emergency room in Springdale, Arkansas. You know, I mean, it's just surreal. 
It's absolutely surreal. And we won't go into the details and, and uh, you know, about the root causes, but there's all, you know, all, so much makes sense. You know, it all yeah. makes sense. It's all completely for a reason. <laughs> um, but you betcha, I will write you. That's, a <laughs> That's funny. I never knew that it, it, it uh, healed it. Um, yeah. What I want to just say again is, you know, I've worked with a lot of people and most people are not ready to change. They're, yeah, they're willing important. to experience things. They're willing to open up. They're willing to give it a thought. But it, it, it's, I think, more than a, a deep state, you just have to be at the point where you are ready to change. And Make it, means, it means doing things differently. Yep. It means taking, you know, not being a victim, doing some research and learning about how we write our scenarios in life and we're not victims and then we have the freedom to react to them. It's all due to the amnesia, uh, whatever. But we have to, to uh, find a way to, to ask ourselves to, you know, show an issue, show what, what, what I find really, really important is that a lot of times the healing happens in a little while and it's because you're being guided and it might not just be a snafu like miracle it may be that you have to change your perception like i thought something was happening the other day and i listened to the and i thought it was someone doing something to me and then i watched a joseph lavatsky or whatever uh video about hypnosis and he pointed to the, uh, he said, you know, if you're put, taking makeup off, you don't take it off of the mirror, you take it off of yourself. So I said wow. that to myself. I said, well, maybe I'm going to take that look and say, is this me instead of that person? So I did what I could do in my thing, in my sphere, and it cleared up. Wonderful. So, so it, you know, it was like, I was, my higher self showed me, got me to watch the Joseph thing, got me to realize something. I made a change in perception. And all of a sudden, the resistance I had to this person let go. And as soon as it let go, everything got better. And then when I realized it was really me, then it really left. So, you know, it's, it's, it's having this relationship with your higher self. It's being open to, to be shown things through intuition or signs or just faith that you want a change, you want a healing. You know, it comes in many different packages, but I think the biggest part of this all is to forge a, a daily relationship with your higher self okay. and take care of your own emotions. Okay. Um, actually, so in the, uh, in the question and answer room, um, Nina says, uh, the chat room is closed and we can't see both screens. We can only see the person speaking. So we didn't get to see the 33. Um, we will make those uh, images available to you all. And actually, I believe, um, well, I'm not sure. This, is, this interface is new and it's one of the reasons you know, we're going to practice and do this. I'm not sure what it will look like. I'm still trying to figure out what a what a viewer sees, what I see, what a panelist sees, but we will make sure to have the images of the painting and the 33 chiclet <laughs> branding number on, uh, on Lori's leg. Uh, all of you will be able to see that. We, we will make sure I will put it on this video or um, uh, links to it. Thank you so much for talking about, you know, making a change. I think what is uh, about healing, what is important to understand here you know, we as humans, we've been very much programmed, especially in the Western tradition, but we've been programmed that you don't heal yourself, you go to a doctor for healing, you go to somebody else for healing. And, and usually, you know, a medical professional, somebody who's been trained, the only people who can heal you are doctors. This is this, you know, this big fat program in our lives. And to even get some of us interested in the idea that we can heal ourselves by coming to alternative people like us who can help them and help facilitate some self-healing, that programming is still running a little bit, which is basically, I'm going to go do this to go get healing, which 
they still have the same kind of mindset. I'm going to go to Lori. I'm going to go to Candace, and they're going to heal me. And, you know, we try to take that away. We try to say, no, 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 that's not the way it works. But that program, you know, that those people have been running under it is very, very strong. And so sometimes that's where the disconnect of why healing doesn't happen, because you're so right. It, there needs to be some sort of change made, because... And, uh, and uh, I, I think... Uh, Fundamental thing is when people come to me, I say, you may get like, you know, fireworks and you may not, but what I'm doing for you is I'm showing you that it's possible to have a relationship who, with who you really are and, mm -hmm. and, and start to identify with your immortality and start mm -hmm. to work with it. And that's where inner personal healing is and you can access it. And if we don't get to it today, at least you will have a relationship started. You'll know how to do it. And it's just a matter of whether you'll work at it and, and start to get results. Mm -hmm. So did you say fireworks on purpose or on accident? <laughs> well, I, it just came out, but, but it probably was in there to begin with. Ah, uh, okay. Well, Lori, this has been... Um, so wonderful spending this time with you. Um, I'd love to do this again at some other point, talk about some other sessions or um, some other cases that we, um, you know, might take us down that road. I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, I'd like to thank those of you also who have joined us today for um, taking the time out of your day to listen and to answer some questions and to make some observations about what's going on here. And for those of you who are watching in the future, the recording, look for more of these and let us know what you want to talk about. What kind of things can we talk about? What are you interested in as it concerns this work? There's always so much to talk about. Um, I'm still a little uh, taken aback by the limes, the lemon, and the water about all of this. There's so much more going on. Um, Dolores, I think, has a lot more to uh, share in these mm, uh, tangents of, you know, exploration of, of all of the different connections, the soup that you're talking about. Also, isn't that interesting? You know, liquid. <laughs> the, the soup of all of and what's going on. I think this is an exciting time to be a practitioner. There's more coming to light. There's more available to us. Uh, more people are hearing Dolores, including many practitioners out there. There's still, I would say, 80% of you out there are still too shy to share what you are hearing in their sessions and in your meditations and in your dreams about Dolores, but we'd love to have you share them publicly. I'm happy to hear it all privately, and uh, I'm glad you're sharing in that way, but I'm hoping some of these people will come forward uh, because Dolores has a lot to say on many other um, and expanded issues uh, from her expanded perspective right now. Lori, this was amazing. Um, thanks again. Can you send me and find some good pictures, some JPEG images, send them to me, and I'll get them attached to, uh, to this project, to this recording for everyone else to see. Will do. Okay. All right. Well, you have, a, you have a great rest of the day. Thank you all for joining us, and see you next time. See you on the forum till then. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.